look at what things have become now, there's no word for it. Each time something else strange happens, everyone knows who's to blame. The details might change, but the style is the same. Chaos Legion, bringing Hogwarts to the brink of disruption. Thank you for coming, Harry. First, do you have with you the notes of yesterday's encounter with Lucius Malfoy? Notes? Surely you wrote it down, said the old wizard, and his voice trailed off. Harry felt rather embarrassed. Yes, if you'd just fumbled through a mysterious conversation full of significant hints you didn't understand, the bloody obvious thing to do would be to write it all down immediately afterward before the memory had faded, so you could try to figure it out later. All right, from memory then. Harry sheepishly recited as best he could, and got almost halfway through before he realized that it wasn't smart to just go around telling the possibly crazy headmaster everything. At least, not without thinking about it first. But then, Lucius was definitely a bad guy, and Dumbledore's opponent, so it probably was a good idea to tell him, and Harry had already started talking, and it was too late to try and calculate things out now. Harry finished his recollections honestly. Dumbledore's face had grown more remote as Harry went on, and at the end there was a look of ancientness about him, a sternness in the air. I suggest you take the best of care that the heir of Malfoy does not come to harm then, and I will do the same. And I think it would be most extremely wise of you to avoid all interactions with Lord Malfoy henceforth. Did you intercept owls from him to me? The headmaster gazed at Harry for a long moment, then reluctantly nodded. For some reason, Harry wasn't feeling as outraged as he should have been. Maybe it was just that Harry was finding it very easy to sympathize with the headmaster's point of view right now. Even Harry could understand why Dumbledore wouldn't want him to interact with Lucius Malfoy. It didn't seem like an evil deed. Not like the headmaster blackmailing Zabini, for which they had only Zabini's word, and Zabini was wildly untrustworthy. In fact, it was hard to see why Zabini wouldn't just tell the story that got him the most sympathy from Professor Quirrell. How about if, instead of protesting, I say that I understand your point of view, and you go on intercepting my owls, but you tell me who from? I have intercepted a great many owls to you, I am afraid. You are a celebrity, Harry, and you would receive dozens of letters a day, some from far outside this country, did I not turn them back. That seems like going a little too far. Many of those letters will be asking you for things you cannot give. I have not read them, of course only turn them back to their senders undelivered. But I know, for I receive them too. And you are too young, Harry, to have your heart broken six times before breakfast each morning. He should insist on reading the letters and judging for himself, but... There was a small voice of common sense inside him, and it was screaming very loudly right now. Thank you. The other reason I asked you here was that I wished to consult your unique genius. Transfiguration? No, not that unique genius. Tell me, Harry, what evil could you accomplish if a Dementor were allowed onto the grounds of Hogwarts? It developed that Professor Quirrell had asked, or rather demanded, that his students test their skills against an actual Dementor after they learned the words and gestures to the Patronus charm. Professor Quirrell is unable to cast the Patronus charm himself, which is never a good sign. But then, he volunteered that fact to me in the course of demanding that outside instructors be brought in to teach the Patronus charm to every student who wishes to learn. He offered to pay the expense himself if I would not. This impressed me greatly. 
but now he insists on bringing in a Dementor. Headmaster, Professor Quirrell believes very strongly in live fire tests under realistic combat conditions. Wanting to bring in an actual Dementor is completely in character for him. In character? I mean, it's entirely consistent with the way Professor Quirrell usually acts. Harry trailed off. Why had he put it that way? So you have the same sense I do, that it is an excuse. A very reasonable excuse, to be sure. More so than you may realize. Often, wizards seemingly unable to cast the Patronus charm will succeed in the presence of an actual Dementor, going from not a single flicker of light to a full corporeal Patronus. Why this should be, no one knows, but it is so. Then I really don't see why you're suspicious. Harry, the defense professor has asked me to pass the darkest of all creatures through the gates of Hogwarts. I must be suspicious, and yet the Dementor will be guarded, warded, in a mighty cage. I will be there myself to watch it at all times. I cannot think of what ill could be done, but perhaps I am merely unable to see it. And so, I am asking you. Me? Yes. I try my best to anticipate my foes, to encompass their wicked minds and predict their evil thoughts. There are those who say that to comprehend evil is to become evil, but they are merely pretending to be wise. Rather, it is evil which does not know love and dares not imagine love and cannot ever understand love without ceasing to be evil. And I suspect that you can imagine your way into the minds of dark wizards better than I ever could, while still knowing love yourself. So, Harry, if you stood in Professor Quirrell's shoes, what misdeeds could you accomplish after you tricked me into allowing a Dementor onto the grounds of Hogwarts? Dumbledore was asking him to outwit Professor Quirrell. Point 1. Harry was rather fonder of Professor Quirrell than of Dumbledore. Point 2. The hypothesis was that the defense professor was planning to do something evil, and in that subjunctive case, Harry ought to be helping the headmaster prevent it. Point 3. Headmaster, if Professor Quirrell is up to something, I'm not sure I can outwit him. He's got a lot more experience than I do. You underestimate yourself. That was the first time anyone had ever said that to Harry. I remember a young man in this very office, cold and controlled as he faced down the head of House Slytherin, blackmailing his own headmaster to protect his classmates. And I believe that young man is more cunning than Professor Quirrell. More cunning than Lucius Malfoy, that he will grow to be the equal of Voldemort himself. It is he who I wish to consult. Harry suppressed the chill that went through him at the name. How much does he know? The headmaster had seen Harry in the grip of his mysterious dark side, as deep as Harry had ever sunk into it. Harry still remembered what it had been like, invisibly time-turned, as his past self faced down the older Slytherins. The boy with the scar on his forehead, who didn't act like the others. Of course the headmaster would have noticed something odd about the boy in his office. And Dumbledore had concluded that his pet hero had cunning to match his destined foe, the Dark Lord. Which wasn't asking for very much, considering that the Dark Lord had put a clearly visible dark mark on all his servants' left arms and that he'd slaughtered the entire monastery that taught the martial art he'd wanted to learn. Enough cunning to match Professor Quirrell would be a whole different order of problem. But it was also clear that the headmaster wouldn't be satisfied until Harry went all cold and darkish and came up with some sort of answer that sounded impressively cunning, which had better not actually get in the way of Professor Quirrell teaching defense. And of course, Harry would go over to his dark side and think it through from that direction, just to be honest, and just in case. Tell me everything about how the Dementor is to be brought in, and how it is to be guarded. The Dementor would be transported to the grounds of Hogwarts by an Auror trio, all three personally known to the Headmaster, and all three able to cast a Corporeal Patronus charm. 
they would be met at the edge of the grounds by Dumbledore, who would pass the Dementor through the Hogwarts wards. Harry asked if the pass was permanent or temporary, whether someone could just bring in the same Dementor again the next day. The pass was temporary, replied the headmaster with an approving nod, and the explanation went on. The Dementor would be in a cage of solid titanium bars. Students awaiting their turn would stay well back of the Dementor, behind two corporeal Patronuses maintained by two of the three Aurors at any given time. Dumbledore would wait by the Dementor's cage with his Patronus. A single student would approach the Dementor, and Dumbledore would dispel his Patronus, and the student would attempt to cast their own Patronus charm. And if they failed, Dumbledore would restore his Patronus before the student could suffer any permanent damage. Past dueling champion Professor Flitwick would be present while there were students near, just to add safety margin. And if Dumbledore's Patronus did fail for some reason, while one of the students was still near the Dementor, the third Auror would cast another corporeal Patronus and send it to shield the student. Harry poked and prodded, but he couldn't see a flaw in the security. So Harry took a deep breath and remembered. And that will be... five points? No. Let us make it an even ten points from Ravenclaw for back chat. The cold came more slowly now, more reluctantly. Harry hadn't been calling much on his dark side lately. Harry had to run through that entire session in potions in his mind before his blood chilled into something approaching deadly crystalline clarity. And then he thought of the Dementor. And it was obvious. The Dementor is a distraction. A large, salient threat, but in the end straightforward and easy to defend against. So while all your attention is focused on the Dementor, the real plot will be happening elsewhere. Dumbledore stared at Harry for a moment, and then gave a slow nod. Yes, and I do believe I know what it might be a distraction from, if Professor Quarrel means ill. Thank you, Harry. The headmaster was still staring at Harry, a strange look in those ancient eyes. What? said Harry with a tinge of annoyance, the cold still lingering in his blood. I have another question for that young man. It is something I have long wondered to myself, yet been unable to comprehend. Why? Why would anyone deliberately make himself a monster? Why do evil for the sake of evil? Why Voldemort? Harry stared at the headmaster in surprise. How would I know? Am I supposed to magically understand the Dark Lord because I'm the hero or something? Yes! My own great foe was Grindelwald, and him I understood very well indeed. Grindelwald was my dark mirror, the man I could so easily have become had I given in to the temptation to believe that I was a good person, and therefore always in the right. For the greater good, that was his slogan, and he truly believed it himself, even as he tore at all Europe like a wounded animal. And him I defeated in the end. But then after him came Voldemort to destroy everything I had protected in Britain. He committed acts worse by far than Grinwald's worst. Horror for the sake of horror. I sacrificed everything only to hold him back. And I still don't understand why. Why, Harry? Why did he do it? He was never my destined foe but yours, so if you have any guesses at all, Harry, please tell me why! The truth was that Harry hadn't read up on the Dark Lord yet, and right now he hadn't the tiniest clue. And somehow that didn't seem like an answer the Headmaster wanted to hear. Too many Dark Rituals, maybe? In the beginning he thought he'd do just one, but it sacrificed part of his good side, and that made him less reluctant to perform other Dark Rituals. So he did more and more rituals in a positive feedback cycle until he ended up as a tremendously powerful monster. No, I can't believe that, Harry. There has to be something more than just that. Why should there be, thought Harry, but didn't say it, because it was clear that the headmaster thought the universe was a story and had a plot, and that huge tragedies weren't allowed to happen except for equally huge, significant reasons. I'm sorry, Headmaster. The Dark Lord doesn't seem like much of a dark mirror to me, not at all. 
There isn't anything I find even the tiniest bit tempting about nailing the skins of Yermi Wibble's family to a newsroom wall. Have you no wisdom to share? Evil happens. It doesn't mean anything or teach us anything except not to be evil. The Dark Lord was probably just a selfish bastard who didn't care who he hurt, or an idiot that made stupidly avoidable mistakes that snowballed. There is no destiny behind the ills of this world. If Hitler had been allowed into architecture school like he wanted, the whole history of Europe would have been different. If we lived in the sort of universe where horrible things were only allowed to happen for good reasons, they just wouldn't happen in the first place. And none of that, obviously, was what the headmaster wanted to hear. Well, sounding wise wasn't difficult. It was a lot easier than being intelligent, actually, since you didn't have to say anything surprising or come up with any new insights. You just let your brain's pattern-matching software complete the cliché using whatever deep wisdom you'd stored previously. Headmaster, I would rather not define myself by my enemies. Somehow, even in the midst of all the whirring and ticking, there was a kind of silence. That had come out a bit more deeply wise than Harry had intended. You may be very wise, Harry. I do wish that I could have been defined by my friends. The pain in his voice had grown deeper. Harry's mind searched hastily for something else deeply wise to say that would soften the unintended force of the blow. Or perhaps it is the foe that makes the Gryffindor, as it is the friend that makes the Hufflepuff and the ambition that makes the Slytherin. I do know that it is always, in every generation, the puzzle that makes the scientist. It is a dreadful fate to which you condemn my house, Harry. For now that you remark on it, I do think that I was very much made by my enemies. But you have answered my question. I should have realized that would be a Slytherin's key. For his ambition, all for the sake of his ambition. And that I know, though not why. For a time, Dumbledore stared off into nothingness, then he straightened, and his eyes seemed to focus on Harry again. And you, Harry, you name yourself a scientist? You don't like science? He'd hoped Dumbledore would be fonder of muggle things. I suppose it's useful to those without wands, but it seems a strange thing by which to define yourself. Is science as important as love? As kindness? As friendship? Is it science that makes you fond of Minerva McGonagall? Is it science that makes you care for Hermione Granger? Will it be science to which you turn when you try to kindle warmth in Draco Malfoy's heart? You know, the sad thing is, you probably think you just uttered some kind of incredibly wise knockdown argument. Now, how to phrase the rejoinder in such fashion that it also sounded incredibly wise? You are not a Ravenclaw, and so it might not have occurred to you that to respect the truth and seek it all the days of your life could also be an act of grace. How did you become so wise, so young? Perhaps it will prove valuable to you. Only for impressing ancient wizards who are overly impressed with themselves, thought Harry. He was actually a bit disappointed by Dumbledore's credulity. It wasn't that Harry had lied. But Dumbledore seemed far too impressed with Harry's ability to phrase things so that they sounded profound, instead of putting them into plain English like Richard Feynman had done with his wisdom. Love is more important than wisdom, said Harry, just to test the limits of Dumbledore's tolerance for blindingly obvious cliches completed by sheer pattern matching without any sort of detailed analysis. The headmaster nodded gravely and said, Indeed. Well, I'd better go off and love something then. That's bound to help me defeat the Dark Lord. And next time you ask me for advice, I'll just give you a hug. This day you have helped me much, Harry. And so there is one last thing I would ask that young man. Great. Tell me, Harry, why do dark wizards fear death so greatly? Uh, sorry. I've got to back the dark wizards on that one. What? Death is bad. Very bad. Extremely bad. Being scared of death is like being scared of a great big monster with poisonous fangs. 
it actually makes a great deal of sense and does not, in fact, indicate that you have a psychological problem. The headmaster was staring at him as though he'd just turned into a cat. Okay, let me put it this way. Do you want to die? Because if so, there's the smuggle thing called a suicide prevention hotline. When it is time, not before, I would never seek to hasten the day, nor seek to refuse it when it comes. I think I may have not made myself clear. Dark wizards are not eager to live. They fear death. They do not reach up towards the sun's light, but flee the coming of night into the infinitely darker caverns of their own making, without moon or stars. It is not life they desire, but immortality. They are so driven to grasp at it that they will sacrifice their very souls. Do you want to live forever, Harry? Yes, and so do you. I want to live one more day. Tomorrow I will still want to live one more day. Therefore I want to live forever, proof by induction on the positive integers. If you don't want to die, it means you want to live forever. If you don't want to live forever, it means you want to die. You've got to do one or the other. I'm not getting through here, am I? The two cultures stared at each other across a vast gap of incommensurability. I have lived a hundred and ten years. I have seen and done a great many things, too many of which I wish I had never seen or done. And yet, I do not regret being alive, for watching my students grow is a great joy that has not yet begun to wear on me. But I would not wish to live so long that it does. What would you do with eternity, Harry? Harry took a deep breath. <sighs> Meet all the interesting people in the world, read all the good books, and then write something even better. Celebrate my first grandchild's 10th birthday party on the moon. Celebrate my first great-great-great-grandchild's 100th birthday party around the rings of Saturn. Learn the deepest and final rules of nature. Understand the nature of consciousness. Find out why anything exists in the first place. Visit other stars. Discover aliens. Create aliens. Rendezvous with everyone for a party on the other side of the Milky Way once we've explored the whole thing. Meet up with everyone else who was born on old Earth to watch the sun finally go out. And I used to worry about finding a way to escape this universe before it ran out of neg entropy, but I'm a lot more hopeful now that I've discovered the so-called laws of physics are just optional guidelines. I did not understand much of that. But I must ask, if these are things that you truly desire so desperately, or if you only imagine them so as to imagine not being tired as you run and run from death. Life is not a finite list of things that you check off before you're allowed to die. It's life. You just go on living it. If I'm not doing those things, it'll be because I found something better. In the unlikely event that I am permitted to tarry until a hundred and fifty, I do not think I would mind. But two hundred years would be entirely too much of a good thing. Yes, well, Harry said, his voice a little dry as he thought of his mum and dad and their allotted span if Harry didn't do something about it. I suspect, Headmaster, that if you came from a culture where people were accustomed to living four hundred years, that dying at 200 would seem just as tragically premature as dying at, say, 80. Perhaps I would not wish to die before my friends, nor live on after they had all gone. The hardest time is when those you love the most have gone on before you, and yet others still live, for whose sake you must stay. Do not mourn me too greatly, Harry. When my time comes, I will be with those I have long missed on our next great adventure. Oh, you believe in an afterlife. I got the impression wizards didn't have religion? How can you not believe it? Harry, you're a wizard. You've seen ghosts. Ghosts. You mean those things like portraits, stored memories and behaviors with no awareness or life accidentally impressed into the surrounding material by the burst of magic that accompanies the violent death of a wizard. 
I've heard that theory repeated by wizards who mistake cynicism for wisdom, who think that to look down upon others is to elevate themselves. It is one of the silliest ideas I've heard in a hundred and ten years. Yes, ghosts do not learn or grow, because this is not where they belong. Souls are meant to move on. There is no life remaining for them here. And if not ghosts, then what of the veil? What of the resurrection stone? All right. I'll hear out your evidence, because that's what a scientist does. But first, Headmaster, let me tell you a little story. You know, when I got here, when I got off the train from King's Cross, I don't mean yesterday, but back in September, when I got off the train then, Headmaster, I'd never seen a ghost. I wasn't expecting ghosts. So when I saw them, Headmaster, I did something really dumb. I jumped to conclusions. I... I thought there was an afterlife. I thought no one had ever really died. I thought that everyone the human species had ever lost was really fine after all. I thought that wizards could talk to people who'd passed on, that it just took the right spell to summon them, and that wizards could do that. I thought I could meet my parents who died for me, and tell them that I'd heard about their sacrifice, and that I'd begun to call them my mother and father. And then I asked Hermione, and she said that they were just after images, burned into the stone of the castle by the death of a wizard, like the silhouettes left on the walls of Hiroshima. And I should have known. I should have known without even having to ask. I shouldn't have believed it even for all of 30 seconds. Because if people had souls, there wouldn't be any such thing as brain damage. If your soul could go on speaking after your whole brain was gone, how could damage to the left cerebral hemisphere take away your ability to talk? And Professor McGonagall, when she told me about how my parents had died, she didn't act like they'd gone away on a long trip to another country, like they'd emigrated to Australia back in the days of sailing ships, which is the way people would act if they actually knew that death was just going somewhere else, if they had hard evidence for an afterlife, instead of making stuff up to console themselves. It would change everything. It wouldn't matter that everyone had lost someone in the war. It would be a little sad, but not horrible. And I'd already seen that people in the wizarding world didn't act like that. So I should have known better. And that was when I knew that my parents were really dead and gone. Forever and ever. And there wasn't anything left of them. And that I'd never get a chance to meet them. And... And... And the other children thought I was crying because I was scared of ghosts. The old wizard's face was horrified. So, tell me, headmaster. Tell me about the evidence. But don't you dare exaggerate a single tiny bit of it. Because if you give me false hope again, and I found out later that you lied or stretched things just a little, I won't ever forgive you for it. What's the veil? The veil is a great stone archway kept in the Department of Mysteries, a gateway to the land of the dead. And how does anyone know that? Don't tell me what you believe. Tell me what you've seen. The physical manifestation of the barrier between worlds was a great stone archway, old and tall and coming to a sharp point, with a tattered black veil like the surface of a pool of water stretched between the stones rippling, always, from the constant and one-way passage of the souls. If you stood by the veil, you could hear the voices of the dead calling, always calling in whispers barely on the wrong side of comprehension, growing louder and more numerous if you stayed and tried to hear as they tried to communicate. And if you listened too long, you would go to meet them, and in the moment you touched the veil, you would be sucked through and never be heard from again. That doesn't even sound like an interesting fraud. Someone built a stone archway, made a little black rippling surface between it that vanished anything it touched, and enchanted it to whisper to people and hypnotize them. What's the resurrection stone? I would not tell you, save that I fear what this disbelief may do to you. So listen then, Harry. Please listen. The resurrection stone was one of the three legendary Deathly Hallows, kin to Harry's cloak. The resurrection stone could call souls back from the dead 
bring them back into the world of the living, though not as they were. Cadmus Peverell used the stone to call back his lost beloved from the dead, but her heart stayed with the dead and not in the world of the living. And in time, it drove him mad, and he killed himself to be truly with her once more. The obvious test to see if the Resurrection Stone is really calling back the dead, or just projecting an image from the user's mind, is to ask a question whose answer you don't know, but the dead person would, and that can be definitely verified in this world. For example, call back... Then Harry paused, because this time he'd managed to think it through one step ahead of his tongue, fast enough to not say the first name and test that had sprung to his mind. Your dead wife, and ask her where she left her lost earring, or something like that. Did anyone do any tests like that? The Resurrection Stone has been lost for centuries, Harry. Well, I'm a scientist, and I'm always willing to be convinced. If you really believe the Resurrection Stone calls back the dead, then you must believe a test like that will succeed, right? So do you know anything about where to find the Resurrection Stone? I got one Deathly Hallow already, under highly mysterious circumstances. And, well, we both know how the rhythm of the world works on that sort of thing. Dumbledore stared at Harry. Harry gazed equably back at the headmaster. And Dumbledore told Harry to draw forth the Cloak of Invisibility from his pouch. At the headmaster's direction, Harry stared at the inside and back of the hood until he saw it. Faintly drawn against the silvery mesh in faded scarlet like dried blood, the symbol of the Deathly Hallows. A triangle with a circle drawn inside and a line dividing them both. Thank you. I shall be sure to keep an eye out for a stone so marked. Do you have any other evidence? Dumbledore appeared to be fighting a struggle within himself. Harry, this is a dangerous road you are walking. I am not sure I do the right thing by saying this, but I must wrench you from this way. Harry, how could Voldemort have survived the death of his body if he did not have a soul? And that was when Harry realized that there was exactly one person who'd originally told Professor McGonagall that the Dark Lord was still alive in the first place. And it was the crazy headmaster of their madhouse of a school who thought the world ran on cliches. Good question. Can you just go ahead and tell me everything you know about how the Dark Lord survived and what it might take to kill him? If he even still exists as more than Quibbler headlines. You are not fooling me, Harry. I know why you are truly asking that question. No, I do not read your mind. I do not have to. Your hesitation gives you away. You seek the secret of the Dark Lord's immortality in order to use it for yourself. Wrong! I want the secret of the Dark Lord's immortality in order to use it for everyone. Albus Percival Wolfric Brian Dumbledore just stood there and stared at Harry with his mouth gaping open dumbly. Harry awarded himself a tally mark for Monday, since he'd managed to blow someone's mind completely before the day was over. And in case it wasn't clear, by everyone, I mean all muggles too, not just all wizards. No, 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 no! This is insanity! Bwahaha! The old wizard's face was tight with anger and worry. Voldemort stole the book from which he gleaned his secret. It was not there when I went looking for it. But this much I know, and this much I will tell you. His immortality was born of a ritual terrible and dark, blacker than pitchest black. And it was Myrtle, sweet, poor Myrtle, who died for it. His immortality took sacrifice. It took murder. Well, obviously I'm not going to popularize a method of immortality that requires killing people. That would defeat the entire point. There was a startled pause. You would use no ritual requiring human sacrifice? I don't know what you take me for, Headmaster. But let's not forget that I'm the one who wants people to live. The one who wants to save everyone. You're the one who thinks death is awesome and everyone ought to die. I am at a loss, Harry. I know not what to say. Only that I am greatly misunderstood by you. I don't want everyone to die, Harry. You just don't want anyone to be immortal. The old wizard nodded. I am less afraid than I was. 
but still greatly worried for you, Harry. For the fear of death is a bitter thing, an illness of the soul by which people are twisted and warped. Voldemort is not the only dark wizard to go down that bleak road, though I fear he has taken it further than any before him. And you think you're not afraid of death? I am not perfect, Harry, but I think I have accepted my death as part of myself. There's this little thing called cognitive dissonance, or in plainer English, sour grapes. If people were hit on the head with truncheons once a month and no one could do anything about it, pretty soon there'd be all sorts of philosophers pretending to be wise, as you put it, who found all sorts of amazing benefits to being hit on the head with a truncheon once a month. Like it makes you tougher, or it makes you happier on the days when you're not getting hit with a truncheon. But if you went up to someone who wasn't getting hit, and you asked them if they wanted to start in exchange for those amazing benefits, they'd say no. And if you didn't have to die, if you came from somewhere that no one had ever even heard of death, and I suggested to you that it would be an amazing, wonderful, great idea for people to get wrinkled and old and eventually cease to exist, why, you'd have me hauled right off to a lunatic asylum. So why would anyone possibly think any thought so silly as that death is a good thing? Because you're afraid of it. Because you don't really want to die, and that thought hurts so much inside you that you have to rationalize it away, do something to numb the pain, so you won't have to think about it. No, Harry. Though I can understand how you must think so. Do you want to understand the Dark Wizard? Then look within that part of yourself that flees not from death, but from the fear of death. That finds that fear so unbearable that it will embrace death as a friend and cozen up to it. Try to become one with the night so that it can think itself master of the abyss. You have taken the most terrible of all evils and called it good! With only a slight twist, that same part of yourself would murder innocence and call it friendship. If you can call death better than life, then you can twist your moral compass to point anywhere. I think that you understand dark wizards very well without yet being one yourself. But your comprehension of me, I fear, is sorely lacking. The old wizard was smiling now, and there was a gentle laughter in his voice. Harry was trying not to go any colder than he already was. From somewhere, there was pouring into his mind a blazing fury of resentment, at Dumbledore's condescension, and all the laughter that wise old fools had ever used in place of arguments. Funny thing. You know, I thought Draco Malfoy was going to be this impossible to talk to. And instead, in his childish innocence, he was a hundred times stronger than you. What do you mean? I mean that Draco actually took his own beliefs seriously and processed my words instead of throwing them out the window by smiling with gentle superiority. You're so old and wise, you can't even notice anything I'm saying. Not understand, notice! I have listened to you, Harry. But to listen is not always to agree. Disagreements aside, what is it that you think I do not comprehend? That if you really believed in an afterlife, you'd go down to St. Mungo's and kill Neville's parents, Alice and Frank Longbottom, so they could go on to their next great adventure instead of letting them linger here in their damaged state. Harry barely, barely kept himself from saying it out loud. All right, I'll answer your original question then. You asked why dark wizards are afraid of death. Pretend, headmaster, that you really believed in souls. Pretend that anyone could verify the existence of souls at any time. Pretend that nobody cried at funerals because they knew their loved ones were still alive. Now can you imagine destroying a soul? Ripping it to shreds so that nothing remains to go on to its next great adventure. Can you imagine what a terrible thing that would be? The worst crime that has ever been committed in the history of the universe, which you would do anything to prevent from happening even once. Because that's what death really is. The annihilation of a soul. The old wizard was staring at him, a sad look in his eyes. I suppose I do understand now. Oh? Understand what? Voldemort. 
I understand him now at last. Because to believe that the world is truly like that, you must believe there is no justice in it, that it is woven of darkness at its core. I asked you why he became a monster, and you could give no reason. And if I could ask him, I suppose his answer would be, why not? They stood there, gazing into each other's eyes, the old wizard in his robes, and the young boy with the lightning bolt scar on his forehead. Tell me, Harry, will you become a monster? No. Why not? The young boy stood very straight, his chin raised high and proud, and said, There is no justice in the laws of nature, headmaster. No term for fairness in the equations of motion. The universe is neither evil nor good. It simply does not care. The stars don't care, or the sun, or the sky. But they don't have to. We care. There is light in the world, and it is us! I wonder what will become of you, Harry. It is enough to make me wish to live just to see it. The boy bowed to him with heavy irony and departed, and the oaken door slammed shut behind him with a thud. The tea itself was something whose name Harry couldn't even pronounce. Or at least, every time Harry had tried to repeat the Chinese words, Professor Quirrell had corrected him until finally Harry had given up. And it still tasted to him like, well, tea. There was a quiet, nagging suspicion in Harry's mind that Professor Quirrell knew this and was deliberately buying ridiculously expensive tea that Harry couldn't appreciate just to mess with him. Professor Quirrell himself might not like it all that much. Maybe nobody actually liked this tea, and the only point of it was to be ridiculously expensive and make the victim feel unappreciative. No, you should not have told the headmaster about your conversation with Lord Malfoy. Please try to think faster next time, Mr. Potter. I'm sorry, Professor Quirrell. I still don't see it. There were times when Harry felt very much like an imposter pretending to be cunning in Professor Quirrell's presence. Lord Malfoy is Albus Dumbledore's opponent, at least for this present time. All Britain is their chessboard, all wizards their pieces. Consider, Lord Malfoy threatened to throw away everything, abandon his game, to take vengeance on you if Mr. Malfoy was hurt. In which case, Mr. Potter... It took more long seconds for Harry to get it, but it was clear that Professor Quirrell wasn't going to give any more hints. Not that Harry wanted them. Dumbledore kills Draco, makes it look like I did it, and Lucius sacrifices his game against Dumbledore to get at me? That doesn't seem like the headmaster's style, Professor Quirrell. Harry's mind flashed back to a similar warning from Draco, which had made Harry say the same thing. Professor Quirrell shrugged and sipped his tea. Harry sipped his own tea and sat in silence. Professor Quirrell, is there an afterlife? Harry had chosen the question carefully. Not, do you believe in an afterlife, but simply, is there an afterlife? What people really believed didn't seem to them like beliefs at all. People didn't say, I strongly believe in the sky being blue. They just said, the sky is blue. Your true inner map of the world just felt to you like the way the world was. If there is, Mr. Potter, then quite a few wizards have wasted a great deal of effort in their searches for immortality. That's not actually an answer. He'd learned by now to notice that sort of thing when talking to Professor Quirrell. Some of those wizards were reasonably intelligent, Mr. Potter, so you may take it that the evidence of an afterlife is not obvious. I have looked into the matter myself. There have been many claims of the sort which hope and fear would be expected to produce. Among those reports whose veracity is not in doubt, there is nothing which could not be the result of mere wizardry. There are certain devices set to communicate with the dead, but these, I suspect, only project an image from the mind. The result seems indistinguishable from memory because it is memory. The alleged spirits tell no secrets they knew in life, nor could have learned after death, which are not known to the wielder. Which is why the Resurrection Stone is not the most valuable magical artifact in the world. Precisely, though I wouldn't say no to a chance to try it. You spoke to Dumbledore of that as well, I take it. The headmaster can be persuasive, Mr. Potter. 
I hope he has not persuaded you. Heck no. Didn't fool me for a second. I should hope not. I would be extremely put out to discover that the headmaster had convinced you to throw away your life on some fool plot by telling you that death is the next great adventure. I don't think the headmaster believed it himself, actually. He asked me what I could possibly do with eternity, gave me the usual line about it being boring, and he didn't seem to see any conflict between that and his own claim to have an immortal soul. In fact, he gave me a whole long lecture about how awful it was to want immortality before he claimed to have an immortal soul. I can't quite visualize what must have been going on inside his head, but I don't think he actually has a mental model of himself continuing forever in the afterlife. The temperature in the room seemed to be dropping. You perceive that Dumbledore does not truly believe as he speaks. It is not that he has compromised his principles, it is that he never had them from the beginning. Are you becoming cynical yet, Mr. Potter? A little. I'm certainly becoming a bit frustrated with whatever's going wrong in people's heads. Yes, I find it frustrating as well. Is there any way to get people not to do that? There is indeed a certain useful spell which solves that problem. Harry looked up hopefully at that and saw a cold, cold smile on the defense professor's face. Then Harry got it. I mean, besides Avada Kedavra. The defense professor laughed. Harry didn't. Anyway, I did think fast enough not to suggest the obvious idea about the resurrection stone in front of Dumbledore. Have you ever seen a stone with a line inside a circle inside a triangle? The deathly chill seemed to draw back, fold into itself, as the ordinary Professor Quirrell returned. Not that I can recall. That is the resurrection stone? If you happen to see a stone with that symbol, and it does talk to the afterlife, do let me know. I have a few questions for Merlin, or anyone who is around in Atlantis. Quite. By the way, Mr. Potter, I fear we shall have to cut short today's visit to Diagon Alley. I was hoping it would... never mind. Let it stand that there is something else I must do this afternoon. Harry nodded and finished his own tea, then rose from his seat at the same time as Professor Quirrell. One last question. Magic is loose in the world, and I no longer trust my guesses so much as I once did. So in your own best guess, and without any wishful thinking, do you believe there's an afterlife? If I did, Mr. Potter, would I still be here?